All right, chemistry team, you ready for video number nine in our thermodynamic journey? We're getting it, getting into the juicy stuff. This video and the next video, uh, a couple of videos are going to be the meat and potatoes of what we're after. Remember, the ultimate question we ask ourselves in the beginning of this chapter is, hey, here's a reaction or process. Is it going to happen in the forward direction as written? i.e. is it spontaneous and we went through all the second law of thermodynamics derivation and entropy and enthalpy and blah, 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 magic fairy dust magic fairy dust and we said hey if delta g is negative under the conditions stated the pressure temperature blah blah blah, blah it will proceed in the forward direction as written spontaneously without any outside help which would mean the reverse of that would be non-spontaneous uh, same numerical value, just it'd be positive in the reverse direction. So if you have a positive delta G, non-spontaneous under the conditions specified and the temperature specified, negative delta G, it's going to be spontaneous in that direction written. Well, we have developed through our journey so far how to determine delta G at standard conditions, right? Using the thermodynamic tables, especially if you're at 25 degrees Celsius, which is the reference temperature for the tables uh, in the back of your appendix or on my handout here, these babies right here, right? Piece of cake to get delta G naught. If you're at 25 degrees Celsius, the last video we talked about what if you're not, we have to assume delta H naught is temperature independent, uh, delta S naught is, calculate those, plug them in. So you could get it at something other than 25 degrees Celsius. It's just a four-step process instead of a one-step process. But I guarantee you, remember standard conditions, you're at one bar pressure for uh, you know gases, you're at... Um, an activity of one for your solutions. Now we're going to make an assumption that under our conditions we can play, we can use molarities of one instead of activities of one and partial pressures of one instead of, um, I mean, uh, partial pressures instead of activities. So we're going to assume they're relatively the same, uh, you know, assuming ideal gas behavior, you know, no ion interactions uh, between, you know, no salt effect, all that kind of fun stuff. If we make those assumptions, which are pretty valid at the, the, this particular level, we can use concentrations and partial pressures instead of activities and whatnot. All right, so if we're at non-standard conditions, notice that you don't have that little circle on the top, that not symbol, not there. What do we do? Well, that's the purpose of this particular video. In essence, we're just going to take delta G, Gibbs energy at standard conditions, which we know how to calculate, and then just add a correction factor. Yeah, most people don't call it a correction factor. It's a mathematically derived equation. Uh, pretty nasty one to derive. I'm not going to derive it for you. I'm just going to write it up on the board and we'll talk about it. So let's pop that equation on the board. It deserves its own board because it is one of the most important equations in all of thermodynamics. All right, you ready? Here's the kink of of equations right here. If we want delta G at non-standard conditions, remember we're trying to find out if it's negative and spontaneous in the forward direction is written. We're going to take delta G at, not, at standard conditions and add this correction factor, this RT log Q correction factor. All right, think about what we've got on here. We know we can calculate that, right? especially 25 degrees Celsius, that'd be easy. We know R, which is the gas constant, and I'll provide that for you on exams. That's 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin. Now, one thing you got to be careful for. Notice this is in joules. And if you look on your, your thermo tables, delta G and delta H values, but in this case, delta G values, are kilojoules per mole. Ooh! So if I take the universal gas constant, multiply it by the Kelvin temperature. It's got to be in Kelvin so that the Kelvins cancels out. Now, you're probably going to be given a temperature in degrees Celsius because that's what we measure in the laboratory. And then we got to convert it to, cell, to Kelvin. Note there's no degree on the Kelvin. In order to do the mathematics. Same thing when we did gas laws last semester. If I take joules per mole Kelvin times Kelvin, I get joules per mole. And when you take a logarithm, that value, that Q value, remember the reaction quotient from our equilibrium chapters, oh, that's a unitless quantity, right? If we use activities, we're supposed to use activities for that. Because remember, the reaction quotient is for non-equilibrium conditions. 
and that's the concentration, technically the activity of your products raised to the power of their stoichiometric coefficient divided by the concentration or activities of your reactants raised to the power of their stoichiometric coefficient, right on. And if you're dealing with gases, you use their partial, technically their activities, but you can use their partial pressures of the products raised to their power of their coefficient divided by the reactants raised to the power of their coefficient. So we've been doing Q a lot so if you use activities, technically, and we're going to make the assumption that we can use molarities and partial pressures in place of activities, which would make this a unitless quantity. So log of that gives you a unitless quantity. So this correction factor will be joules per mole. Delta G naught will be kilojoules per mole. So a huge mistake people make is they forget to convert the joules to kilojoules because you can't add peanuts to avocados. You got to go. You got to convert the peanut to an avocado so you can add it to the avocado, right? Got to have the same units. And then we'll get delta G at non-standard conditions, right? It's just some adjustment factor for not being at one atmosphere pressure, a molarity of one, those kinds of things, which in the laboratory is pretty common. I'm, you know, we're usually very close to one atmosphere pressure, but if you get a barometer reading, uh, you know, hopefully you've got one hanging on the wall of your lab, you're probably not going to be right at 760 millimeters mercury. Probably going to be a little bit off that. Your solutions, we use one molar a lot, but not all the time. We commonly use 0.1 molar, 0.01 molar. Sometimes I'll use, you know, concentrated nitric acid is a lot of fun. That is not one molar. <laughs> it really hurts too. Make sure you wear gloves and goggles. All right. So here's our equation. And the net factor for this is we know um, delta G has got to be negative to proceed in the forward direction, and it's positive if it's non-spontaneous. So negative is spontaneous, positive is non-spontaneous. So we mentioned this earlier, at equilibrium, there's no driving force to go one way or the other, right? So if delta G is negative, the driving force is to go in the forward direction. If delta G is positive, it's driving force is to go in the, the reactant direction. It, it wants to form more reactants. But if we're at equilibrium, you can see we're gonna be getting to equilibrium in the next video, how these connect. You see where the connection's coming? At equilibrium, delta G is zero. There's no driving force to go more towards products or more towards reactants because at equilibrium, it's in a happy place. The, the concentrations are all constant or the pressures are all constant. The forward rate equals the reverse rate. Everybody's happy. So there's no, no, no reason to produce more products over reactants or vice versa. So delta G is zero. So at equilibrium, Delta G equals zero. That's the driving force for what we're after. So if delta G is not zero, that tells us which way it's going to go to achieve equilibrium. So all reactions drive spontaneously. I'm not sure how to spell spontaneously, but there's my best, best shot at it in the direction to achieve delta G equals zero, right? That is ultimately what is going on. That's supposed to be an equal sign. So if delta G is not zero, if we calculate delta G and it's not zero, this reaction will proceed spontaneously towards the direction in which it can achieve a value of delta G equals zero. And once you're at delta G equals zero, we're at equilibrium and there's no reason for it to go more one way or the other. Hey, there, there we go. So in the next video, we're gonna be plugging delta G equals zero in there and looking at how we can relate thermodynamics to equilibrium, <gasps> but that's for another chapter. Let's do a problem for this. Yay, math. All right, you ready? Expect this type of problem. Guaranteed capital H hint. Wave the red flag. You're going to see this on your exam. <laughs> all right, this puts all of it together. Uh, your coach loves comprehensive problems. Let's me know you're, you're thinking correctly. All right, so let's say we got some reaction. Doesn't matter what I give you, okay? And it's at 25.0 degrees Celsius. And on a test, you go, yay, I can use the thermodynamic table to get delta Gs and all that kind of fun stuff. Woohoo! saves me a whole bunch of steps. Hi diatomic hydrogen gas reacting with diatomic chlorine gas to give us two moles of hydrogen chloride gas. All right. What is delta G? 
I could have asked this a different way. I could have said, is this spontaneous under those conditions? But what is delta G, which will tell us if it's spontaneous or not, when the pressure, the partial pressure of hydrogen is 0 0.50 atmospheres, when the partial pressure of chlorine is 1.75 atmospheres, and the partial pressure of the hydrogen chloride gas is 0 0.03 at, well, <laughs> I choke on a cat, 0 0.038 atmospheres. All right. Don't know if we're at equilibrium, but if we calculate delta G equals zero, we know we're at equilibrium. If we calculate delta G is negative, we know it's spontaneous in the forward direction as written. And if we get delta G is positive, it's going to be spontaneous in the reverse direction. That's why there's a part V based on what we get in what direction is the reaction spontaneous, which is a big hint delta G will not be zero. Because if it was, there would be no spontaneous push towards products or reactants. Oh, so if you get zero, something's weird with the second question. Or your professor's just being a tricky little booger. Here's your steps again. We've got this got that equation I gave you in the prior one. We can calculate delta G not at standard conditions, especially at 25.0 degrees Celsius. We can just go straight shot from the thermodynamic table, take the summation of the products minus the summation of the reactants. Good to go. Takes a while. Takes a whole board for me, but we can do that. Then let's calculate Q. All right, we should be able to do that, and that brings back some nightmares from our equilibrium chapters. What is Q? Plug in the partial pressures. Get the calculate. Get the, assuming we can use those in the place of activities. Go go with the unitless quantities. All right. And then once we have delta G naught and Q, plug into the equation. Delta G is delta G naught plus RT log Q. You know Q. You know delta G. Pop it in. Do it in several steps to track the uncertainty. And uh, let's see what the answer we get. If you're feeling motivated, do it on your own and see if you get what I get. So I'm going to calculate delta G naught on the next board. Then I'm going to erase it. Then I'm going to calculate Q on the following board. So we have lots of space. And then on the third board, I'll plug them into that equation and see what we get. So this is going to be a... a multi-board problem. Do you think this will be worth a lot of points on the test? Yes, it will! Okay, gang. Step one for this. And you could swip, swap steps one and two. You could calculate Q first. You could calculate delta G naught first. Doesn't matter. You need them both. But you can't start with the third step because you need those to plug it into the equation. So let's start with delta G naught. And this is at... 25 degrees Celsius. So we can use our thermodynamic table. Remember, all of these are at 25 degrees Celsius. Ooh, so if we're at 25 degrees Celsius, 298 or 298.15 Kelvin, we can go straight shot into this using our famous equation where you take the sum of the coefficient times the Gibbs energy of formation for the products minus the summation of the coefficient times the Gibbs energy of, energy of formation for your reactants. Now, notice we got a coefficient of 2 here, so watch out for that. We're going to take the HCl uh, times 2 minus the hydrogen times 1 and the chlorine times 1, right? So 2 times the Gibbs energy of formation from our table for HCl gas. Make sure it's gas, not aqueous or liquid or anything like that, right? Minus, and we only have one product, so we only have one term. We have two terms for a reactant. So we've got 1, coefficient of 1, times the value for hydrogen gas, plus 1, coefficient of 1, times the Gibbs energy of formation for chlorine gas. Now... If you remember in the last video, what's the definition of Gibbs energy formation at standard states? It's the form under standard conditions, the formation of exactly one mole of that substance from its elements in their standard states. Notice hydrogen gas is its at one atmosphere of pressure. That's its its diatomic gas, right? That's its most stable state. So to form one mole of hydrogen gas from one mole of hydrogen gas at one atmosphere of pressure, that's going to be zero. Same with chlorine, that's naturally diatomic gas. That's going to be zero. You don't need to look them up here. Right? So let's take two times HCl gas. So let's find HCl gas that's under the hydrogen category. And this is delta G, so it's the second column. So there's HC. You got the aqueous. We don't want the aqueous. We want the gas. And I lost it. HCl gas, negative 95.3. Do you see that? For the gas, not not the HCl aqueous, the gas, negative 95.3. That's where that number comes from. And then for the hydrogen gas, you should know that diatomic hydrogen is its standard state. That's going to have a value of zero. Notice atomic hydrogen is not. Diatomic is its standard form. That's zero. Uh, chlorine, do we even need to look that up? We know that's going to be zero. Save yourself time on the test if it's an element of standard state. Boom, zero for delta H formation. Boom, zero for delta G formation. Boom, not zero for absolute 
entropy. <laughs> All, right. All right, so we're going to take 2 times negative 95.3, which is negative 190.6, limited to one decimal point, right? Because you're technically, this is an addition problem. And this whole term, the whole reactant term, zero. So, whoa, that was easier than we planned. Nice. That'll be kilojoules per mole. Let's do step two, calculate our reaction quotient. All right, let's see if you did it. Let's see if you did it. So let's calculate the reaction quotient. We need that equation, right? Without the equation, we can't get delta G naught, and we can't because we need to know what our reactants and products are and what the stoichiometric coefficients are. And without the equation, we have no idea how to set up the reaction quotient, which we set up exactly like an equilibrium constant, except we're just using initial conditions rather than equilibrium conditions, which is a big hint we're probably not at equilibrium, right? So Q will be the products. Now, these are gases, so this is really a Q sub P, but not required to do a sub P or a sub C if it's all uh, solutions and whatnot. Will be the partial pressure, i.e., we're going to assume that's the activity, uh, so we can leave the units off of the HCl, which I totally forgot what the HCl was. Was that 0 0.038 or something? I think it was. So that'll be the partial pressure of the hydro HCl squared, right? Because we got a two there, so we need to square that, bringing back bad memories. So products over reactants. So we're going to have the partial pressure of hydrogen raised to the power of one times the partial pressure of chlorine raised to the power of one. A lot of people don't put the parentheses there. whoop de dingy do. If you don't want to put the parentheses, you can do it like this. If that makes you feel better, yay! If not, put the parentheses around it. Just don't put brackets, because then you'll confuse that familiarity, <laughs> right? And again, we're, we're going to assume the, that this is undergoing ideal gas behavior. Um, we're not at standard conditions, right? That would be uh, uh, one atmosphere. So this is definitely not standard conditions. If everything was one atmosphere, this would be a pretty boring problem. <laughs> and we wouldn't be using that equation, by the way. So let's plug in our values. So what was high, HCl was 0 0.038, if I remember. So let's put 0 0.038, and let's square that. Good to two significant figures. Uh, I forget what the partial pressure of hydrogen was. Hydrogen in the 0 0.50? I think it was. The other was 1.75. 0 0.50. We do not need to square it. Raised to the power of 1. And I think this was 1.75 for the chlorine. Might have to double check that after I pause it. But then I'd have to redo the whole video. Oh, no. Two significant digits. Two. Oh, I just got really hungry all of a sudden. Must be lunchtime. Uh, three significant digits. Two, two. So we're stuck to two significant digits in our value for Q. All right. So square the 0 0.038 divided by 0 0.50 divided by 1.75. I get 1.650 times 10 to the minus 3. 1.6, good to two significant digits, 5.0 times 10 to the minus third. Right? And we don't know what K is, so we don't know if Q is bigger than K or less than K. We have no idea, or even equal to K. There you go. That's step two. Not too bad. Good, some good review right there. Now let's do step three. Plug it into that gigantoid meat and potatoes equation where we can calculate delta G at non-standard conditions. Please do it before I do. All right, let's see how you did, gang. So one other thing, I'm not going to make this an extra step, but you do realize your temperature is in degrees Celsius that we measure probably with a thermometer in the laboratory. Odds of that being 25.0, pretty slim in the laboratory. That's a pretty warm, toasty day, although it's going to be in the 90 degrees something Fahrenheit here in sunny Southern California. That's, that's pushing up. <laughs> Most of us don't think in terms of degrees Celsius. Some of you do. All right, so I just added my 273.15 to get to 98.150 Kelvin, good to one decimal place, because we're limited by the decimal places and the addition there. All right, what are we going to get here? What are we going to get here? What are we going to get here? We know this. Everybody agree? Check. We know delta G naught. We did that in step one. We calculated Q, the reaction quotient, in step two. We know the temperature. R is a constant I give to you on the test. We know all of this. You can easily calculate delta G at non-standard conditions and see if it's negative or positive or zero. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, so delta G 
Oh, what was delta G not? Negative 190.6 or something like that? Negative 190.6 kilojoules per mole. And then we're going to add R, which was the 8.3145. 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin. I'll put this in brackets here because now we multiply that by the temperature. Whoops. 298.150 Kelvin. See how the Kelvin cancels out? So the units of Kelvin go bye-bye. Is everybody okay seeing joules? and kilojoules aren't going to add together. I'm not going to have enough room on my board here. So I'm going to convert the joules to kilojoules. 1,000 joules per kilojoule. I'm definitely out of board space. It's a fun problem. So joules will cancel. And this will leave me with kilojoules per mole, because the long term is not going to have any units. And then I can add that to the kilojoules per mole. So this whole RT log Q literally acts like a correction factor to the Gibbs uh, uh, energy at standard conditions. Uh, and I've run out of room, so this continues down. And that will be the log of Q, natural log of Q. What was Q? 1.650 times 10 to minus 3. Did the two sig figs. Did not leave myself much space. I, you got a lot more room on your paper than I do. All right. So we got R times the temperature in Kelvin times the natural, converted to kilojoules, times the natural log of Q, which was 1.650 times 10 minus 3, which we calculated in step 2. Good to two significant figures. Just writing that exhausted me. Now I'm even hungrier. I need more calories. I need more glucose for my brain. Ready? So delta G, will be, now we got to calculate this whole term here. So this would be negative 190.6 kilojoules per mole. That's our Gibbs energy at standard conditions at 25.0 degrees Celsius, plus this whole term. Now what I'm going to do, because the logarithm has its own uh, uncertainty tracking, this is all multiplication and division. So if I'm gonna, I really should do this in two steps. I don't have a room on my board. So if you guys are okay, not that you have a choice because I'm the one with the on and off video button. I'm just going to do this number here. Because when you take the logarithm of something, the number of significant digits in that term in the logarithm will determine the number of decimal places in the answer. So I have two significant figures in my Q. That's going to give me two decimal places in the log of Q. So let's calculate that. Now, that's a number less than 1, correct? Isn't it? If you take the log of something less than 1, doesn't that give you a negative value? If it's bigger than 1, it's positive, I think. It's good to review your log stuff. So I think that's going to give us a negative value, which will make this correction factor negative which will add to this negative. So it's going to be even more negative. So delta G at standard, non-standard conditions will be even more negative, more spontaneous than delta G at standard conditions. Wow, check it out. All right, so if we take the natural log, do it on your calculator, do the natural log of 1.650 times 10 to minus 3, see what you get. That negative 6.40. Good to two decimal places because we had two sig figs. Negative 6.4069. So that's the log of Q. And I need that to go, I have three significant figures in the log of Q. I have four significant figures in my temperature. I have the, That's an exact metric conversion, and R is five. I, you don't even need to know if R is exact or not. It doesn't matter because it's got so many sig figs, it doesn't matter. So we're going to be limited to three significant digits from the log of Q term. So this will have three significant digits. All right, so R times T converted to kilojoules times the log of Q, the correction factor, I get negative 15.8. There's our three significant figures, negative 15.8, 82 kilojoules per mole. So that's the correction for not being at standard conditions. All right. And now we can finish this problem. We got one more step. We're adding. We got one decimal place in our Gibbs energy at standard conditions. 
one decimal place in our correction factor, RT log Q. So delta G, I have always had issues writing G, capital G in a pretty way. Well, I got a D in penmanship, so I don't write anything. <laughs> I don't even think they grade, I don't even think they have penmanship classes anymore. But back in, back in the 60s, and late 60s, early 70s, stuff like that, I had to take penmanship classes. All right. So negative, negative. So it's going to be a little more negative than that. 206.4, 206.4, vertical dash line, 82 kilojoules per mole. This is some serious squish factors. You're going to have to pause it, zoom in on that. But I know you can do it, you techie people, you. So this is closer to negative 206.5 than negative 206.4. So that's going to round up to negative 206.5, 206.5 kilojoules, oh my gosh, major squish factor, negative 206.5 kilojoules per mole. That's our delta G at non-standard conditions, which means, that's negative, this is spontaneous in the forward direction. So this will proceed and produce more products than reactants, even though it's reversible. All Technically, all reactions are reversible. Just some of them are so dominant one way or the other, we don't even write reversible arrows. So this is going to drive towards products to the right-hand side in the forward direction as written spontaneously on its own until and that delta G will start to change because the pressures will change. Q will change. The pressures will be changing when we do that because the products will go up, the reactions will go down. So Q will change. This correction factor will change until it cancels this out to give us a value of zero. You see that? And when it's at zero, you're not going to go more towards product or more towards reactants at that point. That's the driving force is to achieve equilibrium, delta G zero. What a bing, what a boom, baby! Next video, equilibrium.